Welcome back, beloved. Today we're continuing our study in the book of Daniel. We are on chapter 7, and this chapter really stands above possibly every chapter in the book of Daniel when it comes to content. There's simply no way, and believe me, I've tried for about a week now, there's no way to fit everything in Daniel 7 into one video. Um, so I decided to make this a three-part series uh, for, for just chapter 7. Part one today, we're just going to go over the four beasts of Daniel, those four beasts of Daniel, which you've probably heard of in the past and maybe you've learned about or studied in the past. And we're going to be looking at them specifically in a historical context uh, and a coming future context. And then part two is going to be the vision of the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man. That's like verses 13 and 14 and so on. And part three is going to be the vision explained, where we bring everything together in one sort of final video and we look at it from a more spiritual application and we look at it in a more uh, futuristic setting as opposed to historical. And so before we jump into Daniel chapter 7, I know this is a complex chapter of the Bible. I wanted to start with some encouragement and just a little bit of guidance. Um, A.W. Pink, he's one of, if not my favorite, favorite author. Um, he died a hundred years ago or decades ago. He died a while ago. He's one of my favorite old dead guys. Um, he's written so many great books and you can just tell from his, his writings how much he loved the word of God. I mean, everything this man wrote was dripping with scripture. His name was A.W. Pink. My favorite book was the sovereignty of God. And you can get all most of his works for free on gracegems.org if you're watching. Gracegems.org, they provide free works of many great Puritans. Now you might be asking, well, what does this have to do with Daniel chapter 7? Well, A.W. Pink devoted his life to studying the scriptures, and his last words were, the scriptures explain themselves. I'm not huge into hermeneutics or anything like that, but what I would say is if we never leave the Bible, if we never leave the Bible, the Bible becomes very simple. God has a simple way of speaking to his children. He reveals mysteries. It's not that we're wise in and of ourselves. Now, we do search the scripture. The Bible says we even search the scripture like we search for treasure. It's, a, it's meant to be fun. It's meant to be enjoyable. But ultimately, it's God who reveals his words. And so I just wanted to share two verses with you meant to encourage you. In Proverbs chapter 1, wisdom is speaking. God is speaking. We, you know, we know Christ became to us wisdom. And it's uh, speaking about repentance. It says, turn at my rebuke. Surely I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. So if you really want to understand the deep things of God and, and some of the more complex portions of his word, it starts with asking the Holy Spirit to reveal them to you. David said in Psalm 119 verse 18, Open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law. And so I wanted to start with that just to encourage us. And now I just want to review very quickly the statue. So we're getting into Daniel chapter 7. We're getting into the vision of the four beasts. Very quick review of Daniel chapter 2, which was the statue that revealed all the great nations. Now, the four beasts are four great kingdoms. They're the same similar four kingdoms, or they're the exact same four kingdoms that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his statue. And it's really quite amazing if you think about it. The statue is how man looks at his kingdoms, at government, at, you know, man looks at art and kingdoms and governments. And look at this beautiful statue from Daniel 2. But when God looks down and sees our governments, what does he see? He sees violence. He sees bloodshed. He sees vicious beasts coming to power. And so the four beasts in Daniel directly correspond with the four types of metal and the clay in Daniel chapter 2. And so I just want to do a quick review. The head of gold, the first kingdom 
was Babylon. The chest and the arms of silver were Medo Persia. The stomach and thighs of bronze were Greece. And the legs of iron were Rome. The feet were partly of iron and clay, which is, we, we've gone over this in the chapter two video. You can go back and watch it. That, the most common interpretation of that is it's a revived Rome. A, you know, Europe essentially being the seat of this final kingdom. However, it will be a global kingdom. And in that Daniel chapter two video, and in Daniel chapter 2, there's a stone cut out without hands. We know that's Christ, right? He's the stone the builders rejected. He destroys all these kingdoms, That is the, and then he fills the earth. That is the millennial kingdom of Christ that is coming to this earth, and then we go after a thousand years to the new heavens and new earth. Now, that's just a very, very 80, 90,000 foot overview of Daniel chapter two. You should have watched that video already, but I just wanted that in your mind. And now we can jump into Daniel chapter seven. So Daniel chapter seven starts with, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. So the historical account of Daniel is pretty much over now. Now it's just prophecy. So it goes back in time. The first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, before the fall of Babylon in Daniel 5, obviously. Daniel saw a dream and visions in his mind as he lay on his bed. Then he wrote the dream down and related the following summary of it. Daniel was essentially preaching and teaching these visions after he had them. Daniel said, I was looking in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Very important. We need to know what does the Bible have to say? What is the great sea? Now, it could be the Mediterranean Sea, but this has a more spiritual language here. You'll see that. So the four winds of heaven are stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts were coming up from the sea, different from one another. Now, we're going to learn in a little while, these four beasts are four kingdoms, four empires, right? And so what is the sea? Well, the sea all throughout the Bible, specifically when we're in prophetic portions of the Bible, like Daniel and Revelation, the sea has to do with the nations, all of humanity. In Revelation 17, we're learning of a false religious system that's described as a harlot riding a beast, the, the government system of the Antichrist. And she sits upon many waters. And it says the waters she sits on are people's multitudes, nations, and tongues. In fact, Isaiah 57 says the wicked are like the tossing sea. It, it cannot be quiet. Its waters toss up refuse and mud. And Daniel 7, 17 later on goes to say these great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings, which would mean that they're kingdoms, who will arise from the earth. They arise from the earth. They arise from humanity. So when it says that the four winds are stirring up the great sea, it's basically saying the sea of humanity, the governments are going to rise out of this. Okay. And then look at the first beast. Now we're going to get into it very straightforward. The first was like a lion. It had the wings of an eagle. I kept looking until its wings were plucked. And it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. And a human mind was also given to it. Now, typically, and a lot of times in Bible prophecy, the most reasonable answer is the answer. So it's most reasonable that this is talking about Babylon because Babylon was the head of gold in Daniel chapter 2, the statue, right? But there's much, much, much biblical evidence of this. So this first nation is described as a lion that has wings of an, e of an eagle. Well, Jeremiah chapter 4, right? God speaks about Babylon in this way. Thus says the Lord, Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 3, to the men of Judah and to Jerusalem, break up your fallow ground and do not sow among thorns. He's essentially calling the nation of Israel to repentance and he's warning of judgment. And look what he says. He says, a lion has gone up from his thicket. A destroyer of nations has set out. He's gone out from his place to make your land a waste. That was a warning about Babylon. And it says a lion is coming up. This was before Babylon. Jeremiah is prophesying before he's taken captive by Babylon. 
Jeremiah 50 verse 17 says, Israel is a scattered flock. The lions have driven them away. The first one who devoured him was the king of Assyria. And this last one, this lion who has broken his bones is Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. So very straightforward. Here's it again, Ezekiel chapter 17, different prophet. It's a parable. Thus says the Lord, a great eagle. Remember, this first beast is a lion with wings like an eagle. And in Ezekiel 17, there's a parable told to the house of Israel. A great eagle with great wings, long pinions, full of plumage, feathers of many colors, came to Lebanon and took away the top of the cedar. Now, I'm not trying to explain this whole Babylon to you, uh, excuse me, this whole parable to you, but he explains this parable in Ezekiel. Behold, the king of Babylon came to Jerusalem. That was the eagle, took its king and princes and brought them to him in Babylon. So in scripture, before Daniel is, is possibly even born or taken captive, we have Jeremiah and Ezekiel calling the kingdom of Babylon both a lion and an eagle in Ezekiel 17 and in Jeremiah 4 and Jeremiah 50. Finally, if you'll remember back, let me pull it back up. In Daniel 7 uh, verse 3, okay, the four great beasts are four kingdoms. Each is different. And this first one, it has the wings of an eagle and the wings are plucked. It's lifted up from the ground. It's made to stand on two feet like a man and a human mind was also given to it. You see, it's so important. I'm not trying to beat a dead horse here. It's so important we identify what this first beast is. And there's so much biblical evidence that it's Babylon because once we identify this first beast, we can be so uh, have so much more assurance of what the next beasts are because they're the ones that conquer this beast. And that's all historically proven. So I'm beating a dead horse because this first one is really, I think, the most important. Remember in Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar is driven away from mankind. He's eating grass like cattle. His body is drenched with the dew of heaven. His hair grows eagle's feathers. And then a couple verses later, and he grows nails like an eagle. And then he says, at that time, my reason returned to me and my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom and my counselors and my nobles. So it's very straightforward. When we look at this first beast, now I want to reread this to you. It, it's a lion, just like Babylon has been portrayed biblically and scripturally. It has the wings of an eagle, just like Ezekiel 17. Babylon is that eagle in that parable. This is all happening before they're taken captive to Babylon. Then the wings are plucked and it's lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. Just like Nebuchadnezzar, he was behaving like an animal and like an eagle in Daniel chapter 4. Then his reason returned to him. A human mind also was given to it. And finally, beloved, I mean, it's just so obvious Babylon is this first kingdom here. But finally, you know, archaeologically, we actually have found that this is, if you Google the Ishtar gate, it was a very famous gate in Babylon dedicated to their gods. This is the image we found. It's literally a lion with eagle's wings. So suffice to say, there is so much biblical evidence. I didn't even give you all of it. There's other verses relating to Babylon being a lion and taking Judah captive. And so there's so much there, but it seems you know, abundantly clear scripturally and historically that Babylon is this first beast that looks like a lion. So now being very confident of the identity of that first beast, the next beast is very straightforward. He says, behold, another beast, a second one, resembling a bear. Now, historically, and I believe this is the simplest, most correct answer, Medo-Persia was the next empire. That was, you know, the, the uh, head of gold was Babylon, and then the silver chest and arms, that was Medo-Persia. Amazingly, it says resembling a bear. Well, a bear is the biggest of all these animals, and Medo-Persia was known by conquering through sheer attrition, meaning they just had the most number of soldiers they could throw in to the battle, kind of like Japan in World War II. They weren't the best soldiers. They had a lot of them. They were a ferocious, large bear. Now, it says this bear is raised up on one side. And what's amazing, this is the Medo-Persian Empire. And Persia is what it's talking about there. It's the side that has way more power, specifically under Xerxes. 
Now it says three ribs were in its mouth. I want to reveal this and then I'll make it more clear. These three ribs are vanquished nations, Babylon, Lydia, and Egypt. Okay, these three ribs are three nations they've conquered between its teeth. They're devouring these nations. And they said to it, arise, devour much meat. And so scripture clearly reveals to us that Babylon fell to Meadow Persia. Uh, Isaiah chapter 13, speaking of the fall of Babylon, says, Behold, I'm going to stir up the Medes against them. They won't value silver or take pleasure in gold. They, they can't be bought off. They want to conquer you. And we went over the Daniel chapter 5 video, you know, the handwriting on the wall. Babylon fell scripturally and historically to the Medes and the Persians. When Daniel was interpreting the vision, the word peers was interpreted as your kingdom's been divided and been given over to the Medes and the Persians. Now, this is where you need to put on your thinking cap, pause the video and rewatch it if you're a little bit confused. This confuses me a little bit. I don't want to describe to you all of Daniel chapter 8 today, because that's what I'm going to do next week, right? However, Daniel 8 is the key that unlocks Daniel chapter 7, at least these beasts, from a teaching perspective. Daniel 8 is the key that unlocks Daniel 7, because the second beast is Medo Persia. And the third beast is Greece. Greece conquered Medo-Persia next. And what's amazing is Daniel 8 talks about Medo-Persia and Greece, but he describes them as different animals. It's a different vision. And Medo-Persia, you'll see from Daniel 8 verse 20, the ram that you saw with the two horns represents the kings of Media and Persia, the Medo-Persian kings. There's a ram with two horns, and in the vision of the beast, the bear is raised up on one side. This is what I want to show you, beloved. Very straightforward. I just want to assure you that we have the right interpretation here, just like I want to make sure I have the right interpretation. In Daniel chapter 8, when he's going over this vision, which I'm not explaining the whole vision right now, he lifts up his eyes and he sees a ram. Now, I just showed you the ram is Medo persia it has two horns that are standing in front of the canal. Horns represent kings or powers. Now, the two horns were long, but one was longer than the other. This is amazing. This is so historically accurate. The Persian uh, side, the, the western side, excuse me, the eastern side, Persia, was stronger. So, so just like the bear is lifted up on one side, one of these horns, these, these empires of the kingdom, this division of the kingdom, is raised up and stronger. And it says the longer one came up last. If you just Google basic Medo Persian history, just like me, I'm not a theologian, I have Google, you'll see Persia came up after Media. Media started, you know, conquering, and Persia came up last, but they were far superior, especially under King Xerxes. And so just like the bear is raised up uh, on one side, that's Persia, the ram, which Daniel chapter 8 says is Meadow Persia, has one horn that's longer. And it gets even more clear. Just like the bear has three ribs in its mouth, it says the ram is budding, conquering in three directions, west, north, and south. It's not conquering to the east because Persia came from the east. You see it on a map so clear. Here's Media. To the right, to the east, would be Persia. They conquered to the west, Babylon, to the north, Lydia, and to the south, Egypt. And these are all historically verified. So I think it's, you know, proven from scripture, proven from history. And I think Daniel 8 reveals it that this bear raised up on one side is the Medo Persian Empire. Persia is that one side that is lifted up higher, just like the horn of the ram in Daniel 8. And those three ribs are three vanquished nations in its mouth, which are the three directions that Medo Persia conquered in. So, knowing that, and that's a very straightforward answer, uh, now we move on to the third beast or the third kingdom. Remember, from Daniel chapter 2, you had the head of gold, Babylon, the chest and arms of silver, Medo Persia, and then the belly and thighs of brass or bronze. That was Greece. And this third beast is Greece. We're going to see this here very clearly. After this, I kept looking, and behold, another one, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings. This indicates swiftness, four wings of a bird. The beast has four heads, remember that, 
and dominion is given to it. So when we're describing these beasts, we're not only describing one king or the first king, we're describing that entire empire. Because you're going to see with Greece next week in Daniel chapter 8, a little horn, Antiochus Epiphanes, extends from Greece over a hundred years after the kingdom is brought about by their king. And so, you know, when we're talking about a beast, we're not just talking about one king and the first king, we're talking about that entire empire until it falls, which is very important for the fourth beast, okay? But it says, after this, I looked a leopard. And what's amazing, this is the smallest of the beasts, and Alexander the Great conquered with the smallest of armies, right? He conquered massive armies with very small armies historically, and the leopard is the fast, it has wings like a bird. And I, what I find amazing here is Alexander the Great just historically conquered the known world faster than any other nation by far. I mean, it's, it's mythically written about him that he conquered the whole world and then cried about it because he was so young. He died at like 33 or 34. He cried about it because he, he had nowhere left to conquer. I mean, it was so fast. And so a leopard is small, but swift like Alexander the Great. And so I think Daniel chapter 8 also reveals this. So in Daniel chapter 8, the ram represents Medo Persia, but you're going to see, in fact, I'll just bring it up really quick. In Daniel 8 verses 20, the ram is the kings of Medo and Persia. It says the shaggy goat represents the kingdom of Greece. So in Daniel 8, Greece is a shaggy goat. But in Daniel 7, Greece is a leopard. Now there's a large horn. We got to put on our thinking caps here. This goat has a large horn between its eyes. It's the first king. It's Alexander the Great. And his horn is broken. Alexander the Great died right after conquering at a very young age. And it says four horns arose in his place, and they represent four kingdoms. That's exactly what happened to Greece. You see, Alexander the Great died, and four kingdoms came out of the kingdom of Greece. So I want to go back really quick in Daniel 8, and I want you to see what's written about Greece and how it lines up with the leopard that has the wings of the bird. Look, I was observing a male goat. Daniel 8 says it very straightforward. This is Greece. We don't have to question this. He's coming from the west over the surface of the whole earth. That's Greece, obviously, without touching the ground. How can a goat not touch the ground? Well, in Daniel chapter 7, it reveals he has wings. The goat has a conspicuous horn between his eyes. A horn is a ruler, a king. This is Alexander the Great. He goes up to Medo Persia, uh, and, and it, he literally goes beside the ram, and he's enraged at him. He strikes the ram, Medo Persia. Greece strikes the ram and shatters his two horns. And the ram had no strength. Medo Persia had no strength to withstand him. Nobody could rescue the ram from his power. So you see, Daniel 8 shows us that Greece conquers Medo Persia. And when that happens, four kingdoms come out of Greece. This is incredible because you, you go back now to Daniel chapter 7, verse 6, and you see that this leopard has four heads, just like in Daniel 8, the four kingdoms. Just like in Daniel 8, Greece didn't touch the world as it swiftly went through it. Why? Because it had wings. You see, it, it moved fast like a leopard. It has four heads and dominion is given to it. And Greece had four kingdoms. And you know what's incredible about this? Daniel 11 has one final prophecy about uh, Alexander the Great. And it says, as soon as he's arisen, as soon as Alexander the Great conquered the world with Greece, his kingdom was broken up and parceled out towards the four points of the compass, those four kingdoms of Daniel 8, or the four heads of Daniel 7, the leopard. Though not to his own descendants, nor according to his authority. You see, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, and Daniel 11 are all talking about Greece. This is all 100% confirmed by history. I'm bringing up a very basic map. History reveals to us when Alexander the Great died, that first king of Greece, when he died, okay, his son was only one years old. And so he couldn't give the kingdom to his son, obviously. So he parceled it out to his four generals. And it became those four kingdoms of Daniel 8, the kingdom of Ptolemy I, the kingdom of Cassander, the kingdom of Lysimachus, and the kingdom of Seleucus. 
very straightforward here. Alexander the Great is one of the most prophesied characters in all of history other than Jesus Christ. It's pretty incredible. And so now we have a basic understanding. Babylon is that lion. Medo-Persia conquered Babylon. They are the bear. And then the leopard conquers the bear. Greece conquers Medo-Persia. And, and those four heads of this beast in Daniel 7 are those four kingdoms of Daniel 8 that dominion are given to. When Alexander the Great died, his generals took over. Now we get into this fourth kingdom. This is where it gets complex. This is where we need to focus. After this, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong. It doesn't look like anything. He doesn't say it looks like a lion. He doesn't say it looks like a cat, a cougar, a, a fish, anything. He just says it's dreadful, terrifying, and extremely strong. It had large iron teeth. That should bring us, teeth are used for attacking. That should bring us back to Rome from Daniel chapter 2. The statue, the iron, was the Roman Empire. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns, just like the statue in Daniel 2 had ten toes. The ten horns are ten kings, okay? And this is really what's amazing, beloved. We're going to bring up some other verses to bring this home in a second. But this is laying out all of human history for us. Very quickly, you had Babylon ruling the known world, Medo-Persia ruling the known world, Greece ruling the known world, then Rome. And Rome ruled for, you know, almost a thousand years. But when they were broken up, what's amazing is Rome was never really conquered. It just sort of fragmented, like the statue of Daniel 2, it, it became iron mixed with clay, it became partly strong and partly fragile. In fact, in the West and in America today, we still largely live in a, in a Roman system. Alexander the Great, the Third Reich, he, uh, I'm sorry, Hitler, is Adolf Hitler, the Third Reich of World War II, he was trying to combine the Third Holy Roman Empire. That's what the Third Reich was. Napoleon, many other famous uh, people from history wanted to reunite Europe under Rome. And what's amazing here is Scripture reveals in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 there will only be four great world empires. And if you look at the math, it's almost as if another nation should have taken over the world by now. But Rome had, and when Rome splintered, I think Scripture is clearly showing us that there will be a revived Roman Empire. There's not going to be a new beast. There's not going to be a new empire. There's going to be this revived final form of the Roman Empire in the last days. And this beast will, will essentially be revived and, and devour the whole world. You're going to see that in a second. But it's not like by now, if you look at the time frame of it, from Babylon to Medo-Persia to Greece, that's just a couple hundred years. It's been, you know, hundreds of years since Rome has fallen. And historians disagree on the date, but somewhere, you know, from eight, you know, around AD 476 or so, and then you had Popple Rome, the religious Rome, right? By now, something else should have taken over, but it hasn't. God seems to be ordering the times of the Gentiles, the times of the nations in a different way until Christ comes back. So he keeps looking and there's this fourth beast devouring, crushing, and trampling the earth with its feet. It's different from all the beasts that are before it, and it has ten horns, okay? Daniel chapter 2, when we're talking about the final kingdom of iron, remember, he says there will be a fourth kingdom, just like there's a fourth beast. As strong as iron, inasmuch as iron crushes and shatters all things, so like iron that breaks in pieces, it's going to crush and break all these in pieces. That's what Rome did. But then he says, in that you saw the feet and the toes, partly of parter's clay, partly of iron. This is the final form of the final kingdom. It'll be a divided kingdom, but it will have in it the toughness of iron, just like the fourth beast has the nails of iron. It says, as you saw the iron mixed with the common clay, the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery. The ten toes are the ten kings. And you see, Daniel chapter 7, verse 23, reveals what this fourth beast is. He says, Thus he said, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms. It will devour the whole earth, tread it down, and crush it. 
So the final form of this Roman Empire, the iron, the teeth of it might be in Rome or Europe, uh, in that area, but it's going to be a worldwide kingdom, which is exactly what Revelation talks about. Its strength might be, it'll be partly strong and partly brittle. I think, you know, you can make a case from scripture. Its strength will most likely come out of Rome or the European Union or that area. And in fact, if you look at the United Nations or the Vatican, all major efforts to unite humanity and, you know, globalism, they do typically arise out of Europe right now, whether it's from a government, you know, globalism or a religious universalism coming out of the Vatican. It is quite amazing that scripture and reality really line up here. Daniel then goes on to say he sees this great beast. It has these 10 horns. And while he's contemplating the horns, he's looking at the horns Behold, another horn comes up, a little one, and one that starts small, came up among them. Three of the first horns, which we know, I'm going to show you later, those are kings, were pulled out by the roots before it. And this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man. That means intelligence. He's a genius. And a mouth uttering great boasts. He is blasphemous. Daniel, all we have to do is line up Daniel with Daniel and Daniel with Revelation. This becomes very clear. The ten horns, Daniel 7.24 as for the ten horns, out of this kingdom, ten kings will arise. So the final form of this final Roman Empire, right? You have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. You have this final form of Rome, ten kings. It will be a global confederacy, okay? They will arise out of this kingdom. Another arises after them, though, and he'll be different from the previous ones. He will subdue or make low three kings. So we don't know exactly how it's going to work. At the time of the tribulation, it will probably be abundantly clear, but he will rise to power. Ten kings will give him authority, Revelation says. I'll bring that up later. And he'll get rid of three kings. There'll be some sort of like political espionage or he'll kill them, or it might just be that he just slowly subdues them and works some sort of deception to take them out of power. Okay. Daniel 7.25 goes on to say he speaks out against the Most High. I'm showing you this verse to show you very clearly this beast of Daniel 7 is the beast of Revelation 13. And that's very important because Revelation 13 was written well into the Roman Empire already being established. Okay, He will speak out against the Most High. That's the Antichrist. He blasphemes. He wears down the saints of the highest one. He persecutes the saints. And he intends to make alterations in times and in law. We'll talk about this more in the third part video. Okay, he is the lawless one. He's changing the laws of God. They will be given into his hand. The saints will be given into his hand for a time, one times two and half a time. So three and a half. That has to do with the three and a half year period, the great tribulation. You're going to see this perfectly lined up in Revelation 13. Remember what we know about this fourth beast. In fact, let's let's bring it back up. Let's go back to Daniel 7, verse 7 really quick. There is a fourth beast, dreadful, terrifying, extremely strong. We know nothing about what animal it looks like. It has large iron teeth. It devours. It crushes. We learned in Daniel 7, 23, it is a fourth kingdom. Uh, it'll be different. It devours the whole earth, treads it down, and crushes it. It has ten horns, Ten kings arise and another blasphemous king arises from it. You line all this up with Revelation 13, which remember, Daniel is written 530 years before Jesus is born. Revelation is written somewhere, depending on, you know, better theologians than me. I'm certainly not a theologian. Most agree around 90 AD. Some make a case for 60 AD. It doesn't really matter in, in this regard for this specific teaching. Revelation 13, look at this. It says, the dragon, the devil, stood on the sand of the seashore, and I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. There's nowhere else in the Bible that these beasts are talked about, this bear, this lion, and the leopard. Look at this. It says, this final beast from Revelation 13, this final kingdom, has ten horns, seven heads. On his horn are ten diadems, ten crowns, ten kings, and on his heads are blasphemous names. And it, so it says, this ten-horned beast, just like the one from Daniel 7, uh, it says it's like a leopard, Greece, and his feet are like those of a bear, Meadow Persia. His mouth is like the mouth of a lion, Babylon, and the dragon, the devil, gave him his power, his throne, 
and great authority. Just like the devil, the little G God of this world, offered Jesus, the, the world in a sense, because uh, he's been given it to, the devil is the ruler of this world under a delegated authority from God. Jesus denied that temptation because Jesus has all sovereign authority from God. Um, however, the Antichrist will take that offer. He will be the ruler of the world. But nowhere else in scripture is there a beast like a leopard, a bear, or a lion. In, in this regard, it's so clear that it's speaking about the same thing here. It has 10 horns. And you can see this final beast is an amalgamation of all these kingdoms, plus the fourth kingdom, plus Rome, plus Europe, and it is a worldwide dominating kingdom. Revelation 13, 5, you hear about the Antichrist. You hear about this little horn that speaks arrogant words. It says there was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words. The beast is given a mouth. It's a, the little horn. The, what speaks for a government? It's its king. There was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemy. 2 Thessalonians 2 talks about this. And authority to act for 42 months was given to him. That is three and a half years times time and half a time. And then once again in Daniel 7, it says he wears down the saints. But in Revelation 13, it was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. So, very straightforward. Daniel 7 is talking about a beast. Dan uh, Revelation 13 is talking about a beast. Daniel 7 mentions 10 horns. Revelation 13 mentions 10 horns. Daniel 7 mentions a little horn that blasphemes God and destroys the saints. Revelation 13 mentions a mouth that blasphemes God and, and makes war with the saints. Daniel 7 says it, uh, there's a kingdom that devours the whole earth, crushes it and tramples it. And Revelation 13 says, who is like the beast? Who can wage war with him? And he's given authority over every people and tongue and nation. And so just to wrap up these four beasts and make sure you have an understanding of them, we have that first beast, a lion with the eagle's wings, that is Babylon. Babylon historically was conquered by Medo-Persia. The bear raised up on one side, Persia, was much stronger than Media. You have Greece, the leopard, swiftness, they conquered Medo-Persia and, and the known world. And then you have this final form of the final kingdom. We know Rome conquered Greece and all the known world uh, at the time. And, and Rome is the kingdom that our Lord came to, in a sense, the Gentile kingdom. And they, they killed Christ with the Jews, right? And we know Rome is the only kingdom, unlike all these other kingdoms, it was never really conquered. It just sort of fragmented. And we even sort of live in a Roman system today, in a sense. And, and at the time of the end, I believe that that empire will be united along with a one world religion. I think scripture is pretty straightforward on this. And out of that final kingdom, 10 kings will arise and the Antichrist will be given authority. Revelation 17 talks about that. They will hand that to him and he will devour the whole world, trample it, crush it down, persecute the saints. And if your name is not written in the book of life, you will worship him. And so that is a, a general and basic understanding of those four beasts of the book of Daniel. Now, next week, we're going to move on to part two, which is the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man. And this, beloved, is my favorite video. I'm so excited to bring this to you. There is so much more to Daniel chapter seven than just the, these four beasts. And so uh, we'll, we'll bring that up next week.